So the title was given as, as new imaging in, in front of temple dementia. But I think a better title is really about how brain imaging can help to understand frontotemporal temporal dementia and, importantly, help us progress towards new and better treatments. But we ought to just spend a moment to think about our aspirations. What would we be asking of this range of imaging technologies? Uh, what could we expect? What can we demand of them? Um, I think three things. The first, which I'm not going to spend much time talking about today because of time, is about their role in stratification and prognostication, in diagnosis even, uh, in clinical use and for trial selection. But I do think they offer uh, a very important set of tools as biomarkers or outcomes in experimental medicine studies, not large-scale uh, clinical trials, but the precursor, trying to get out of preclinical models and into man, showing efficacy and mechanism. And that links to the third role, which is a set of tools to give mechanistic insight into the pathophysiological disease, um, validating our preclinical models, redefining the phenotype, and trying to get the same level of precision as you might have in an experimental or animal model, but to do that for the human disease, the human disease being different from uh, any of the preclinical uh, approximate models. So we can use imaging to try and bridge this gap, this gulf that lies between the rapid advances in genetic foundational causes of FTD and the molecular cell biology and pathology, uh, which is moving apace, but is very disconnected from where we wish to be, which is uh, effective and successful clinical trials. And that's partly because uh, this gulf is just too big to jump. There's no one-to-one -one mapping between these levels of analysis. But we can try and close the gap, uh, thinking from the top down, trying to break down these disorders, the heterogeneous disorders, into complex behaviours that depend on deficits in core cognitive and motor systems, or building up and thinking about the impact of pathology on synaptic fun function, local circuitry, pharmacology, uh, and finding really a, a point of meeting in the middle. And during the talk, I'm going to touch on a range of uh, different methods uh, illustrating this, how we can build bridges and how we can link together almost a chain of methodologies with imaging to help bridge this gap. Starting, though, with pathology, um, you know, traditionally, uh, a sort of pathology would, would go something like this. You uh, take a brain, a patient you may have studied in life, and at post-mortem, histopathology zooming in on areas of relevance like frontal temporal uh, cortex, um, Zooming in further with smart stains and evolution of the uh, uh, histopathological characteristics, which we heard from um, uh, Ian McKenzie earlier, to characterize the pathological basis of these disorders. But inevitably, this comes late in the day, at post-mortem, in all but a handful of cases of opportunistic uh, uh, early biopsies. Um, what we'd really want is tools that can help us quantify the amount and the distribution of pathology earlier in life. And in the last few years, I've seen an explosion of interest in PET ligands, PET ligands that uh, aim to be uh, specific and binding to certain key pathologies. We've been working with the AV1451 ligand developed by Siemens and then taken over by Avid and Lilly, um, designed to bite to uh, tau. Um, and a good place to start evaluating this ligand is in uh, cases with a certain tau uh, pathology, so a MAP Templar 16 mutation. Uh, the case, uh, the grandmother was in a psychiatric hospital uh, in her 60s. The father had a classic behavioral variant uh, presentation um, and pathology to match. He was actually in one of the uh, cases in the 1998 Hutton series, um, uh, identifying this mutation. Um, and came into the brain bank in Cambridge, and his daughter had a PET scan with the AV1451 ligand showing very strong uptake uh, in the light green here in the frontal and temporal lobes, three years into her Floyd BVFTD syndrome. So although it's very nice to see the increased amount of binding relative to, to controls, actually you need to think not just about how much is binding, but where it is. And by using a, an approach that looks at the distribution of binding, uh, we were able to show that using uh, um, Hawaka cluster analysis, this patient was a clear outlier, not just in the amount, but the distribution uh, of where their tau binding was or this ligand binding was. We went on to look at other uh, more uh, common tauopathies, focusing initially on Alzheimer's disease and progressive supranuclear palsy, representing um, three four-peat tauopathies and a four-peat tauopathy family, respectively. There's a number of papers out looking at this, and they all show weak but, insignificant, weak but marginally significant binding in, in many regions. And what they, I think most of the other papers miss is the need to look at more than one area at a time. If you look in individual brain regions, there are trends or weakly significant differences between groups and patients and controls. But let's consider just the very simplest case of a bivariate comparison. 
here comparing the amount of hippocampal binding to midbrain binding. And we can see in between the patients here with PSP in blue and AD in red, clear separation. Okay. So the simple bivariate case, two locations, complete separation of groups. And I think many of the studies published to date have missed the importance and the potential of this ligand and others like it uh, by an oversimplified analysis. One of the other reasons to direct you towards the Passamonte paper in brain is they also looked at post-mortem data. I think this is really important to understand what these ligands are doing, what they're telling us, um, with a combination of um, immunistic chemistry um, and uh, autoradiography to try and confirm what this ligand was binding to in the different cases. Uh, and I think that's unfortunately all, all too rare, even in uh, PET studies. But before we run away and think this, is, this ligand does what it says in the tin uh, and binds to tau, we have to be mindful that it binds to other things, not neuromelanin. Uh, I think there was the evidence for one way oxalase type B is also sketchy, but there's no doubt it binds to something related to TDP43 pathology. So this is a case of, this is seven individual cases of semantic dementia, uh, including cases with Alzheimer biomarkers being negative with PIB and or CSF. And in every single case, there is highly significant uptake uh, in the temporal lobes, uh, consonant with the syndrome. So two right semantic dementia cases, the others had more typical semantic variant uh, PPA. And again, the distribution uh, of the binding, not just its quantity, enables a very simple multidimensional scaling of the images to show clear separation of our patients. So controls in green, the left semantic variant PPAs, and the two right semantic dementias clearly separated based on distribution. For completeness, I'm just going to show briefly, this is unpublished data looking at the properties uh, of this AV1451 ligand in behavioural variant group. This group includes both uh, TDP43 and uh, tau pathology cases and non-fluent uh, aphasia. But moving on, I want to think about the structural determinants now. So in other words, not just the pathology, but what are the structural determinants of behaviour? This is a behavioural and cognitive syndrome um, associated with FTLD. Uh, and by that, I'm going to now include both frontotemporal dementia, PSP, and cortical basal syndrome. And you'll all be familiar with this, or the textbook uh, division of frontotemporal dementia into behavioural and language variants, the sort of can canonical disorders um, of the agromatic, semantic, and logopenic variants that um, Thomas has touched on, uh, cortical basal and PSP. Now, enormous amount of work over the last decade has gone into constructing sensitive and specific um, diagnostic criteria for clinicians. Um, many of you in the room contributed to the papers listed at the bottom. And they're all designed really to focus on clinical features that help bring some specificity. And these are all very well uh, early in the disease, in classic cases. But if you follow cases and look at them and define their phenotype over time, a much more complex picture emerges that's more like this. Okay. And I think this is not spoken about nearly enough uh, in the FTD world. Thomas did, did touch on it. We see, for example, that cortical basal patients will frequently develop a vertical gaze palsy. Behavioral variant FTD patients develop severe semantic deficits during the uh, earlier mid-course of their illness. Um, patients with PSP and CBD develop apathy and impulsivity, even though that's a defining feature of behavioral variant and not PSP and cortical basal syndrome. So what this means is, I think, to understand the disease and to move towards more effective treatments, particularly for symptoms, we need to get away from disease labels and more towards different domains, different aspects of the phenotype. Um, just to expand on that, we're going to, in our, our, our group, we focus on apathy and impulsivity um, because they span the whole spectrum of FTLD disorders uh, and they have a very detrimental effect on outcome as well as uh, burden of, of care costs and distress. So the way I think of it is this, that with a patient with an evolving illness, the, as the illness progresses and spreads to affect additional networks and different areas of the brain, the symptoms uh, will, will, will evolve, typically by adding in layers of complexity, not really losing early symptoms, but gaining. So a patient may begin, let us say, with a behavioural variant phenotype with impulsive, very social behaviours, amongst other problems. And over time, over a small number of years, they add features. They develop falls, perhaps a gaze palsy, and end up severely apathetic. Okay. So the disease is evolving and layering up. And each of these individual elements, these domains, has an, its own underlying network pathology and pharmacology. And this speaks to really the need for a transdiagnostic approach, thinking across diagnostic boundaries, not always within groups. Um, it's a neurological research domain criteria that those that are familiar with the NIMH research domain criteria for psychiatric disorders 
will understand this dimensional approach and how powerful it is. And I'd like to just point you to this recent paper by Claire Lansdell in Brain, which really set this out very clearly in dissociating different <coughs> modes of apathy and impulsivity across the full spectrum of FTLD-associated disorders. This is not just a problem of behavioural variant, FTD. But how do we jump from these structural and pathological changes towards change in function and cognition? And we're going to use a, a series of imaging techniques centered on connectomics to elaborate on this. The first starts with uh, functional MRI. MRI is cheap, it's safe, it's widespread in every hospital, every psychology department. It's reliable, it's repeatable. And we can use it to try and interrogate brain networks. Um, I'll just put here is, this is a map of the global airline network to remind me to say that the brain is a complex network, but there are many other complex networks in our lives, and they have some similar properties. Um, you don't have to connect everywhere to everywhere else. That's extremely inefficient and costly. Um, what you want is a system of having some hub airports. Uh, it might be JFK in New York or Heathrow. Um, from which you, could, you can see here these densely connected areas, from which you can then jump efficiently to other parts of the world. And there were some local transport links. One can get from Trieste to, uh, to uh, uh, the airport with some local links. But you don't have to connect here to Cambridge. I take a, tra a train to Cambridge to the airport, and the airport to uh, Tr Trieste Airport or Treviso tonight, and then, and then to here. And the brain is similar. So you can use fMRI to map out areas of the brain that are connected to each other. It's just a simple visualisation of a, a 500 region parcellation connecting. And the point about doing this is you can then look at what's driving changes in this. So work from Tim Rittman looks first of all at how the expression of the mapped gene uh, across these same regions, uh, derived from the Allen Brain Atlas, was linked to the, what I call the degree, the connection strength. So region by region, to how many other regions was any one place connected? And that correlated with that region's intrinsic uh, expression of the mapped gene. The next thing he did was to actually, the extent of that connectivity also predicts the proportionate loss or disproportionate loss of connectivity in PSP, corticobasal generation, and even Parkinson's disease, all in relation to that uh, mapped gene, not, uh, not some other candidate genes. This is not just the absolute number of connections. Obviously, well-connected areas have more connections to lose. This is the proportionate connectivity. So something about expression of tau leading to high uh, connectivity, well-connected regions, and the loss of vulnerability in disease. The problem with most fMRI is it's confounded by vascular changes, so it's a convolved neural and vascular signal. So we need techniques that can try and separate out neural and vascular components. Um, so we can use a method called dynamic causal modelling, mapping the spectral dynamics of the fMRI series to look at connections amongst um, brain regions. I'm focusing on four canonical brain networks, the default mode network you may be made familiar with, salience network that's um, highlighted in the FTD disorders, and dorsal intention networks. And we can ask how FTD changes interactions, the strength of connectivity within and between those networks. And we're going to be interested in separating the hemodynamic response profiles from that neural connectivity, which speaks directly to the, the disease. This study um, is using methods published uh, by Carmen Svetanov last year, but I'm going to show you the data uh, as yet unpublished from the GenFi um, study. This is, for those that don't know, an international consortium which now has 700 uh, uh, people, healthy people and patients from families with monogenic uh, FTD. We're looking at the first data release data. If we look at those regions and look at the degree of atrophy, all of the regions in those networks are atrophic to a degree, and if we use the atrophy in those regions to separate symptomatic patients from healthy gene-negative family members, uh, we see we get accurate classifications of rock curve analysis showing high discrimination based on atrophy. If we use standard approaches to functional connectivity with a correlational analysis, um, we can distinguish patients um, with symptoms from their G-negative carrier families, but actually it's not very, not very effective. And our error in the curve of 0.76 is not very impressive for such a dramatic disease. But if we are able to separate out the, uh, the neural connectivity or effective connectivity from the hemodynamic properties, what we see is a very striking, almost perfect by one individual separation between the patients and controls. It's not a very high benchmark, but it's an essential, I think, to know that your method can at least distinguish groups. What we then can do, which I thought was even more exciting, was to take the neural connectivity, which is a multivariate problem. There are many connections which form a set of connectivity parameters, and ask how those relate to cognitive deficits across a neuropsychological battery. So using a canonical uh, covariance analysis to relate connectivity, 
at the neural level to cognitive performance. And there's a, very, there's a strong linear relationship that becomes stronger in symptomatic patients. In other words, as you become into your symptomatic phase, you develop a strong relationship between how poorly connected your brain is becoming and your cognitive decline that is present but weaker in healthy uh, family members. We can think about other ways to kind of quantify the global pro uh, properties of uh, a, a, a network. Think about the brain as a graph analogous to the airline network. We could imagine there are nodes that are poorly connected. To, I have, have low degree, they're not connected to many other regions. Contrasting with areas that are, have high degree, that are connected to many other places. We can have clusters, re brain regions where um, it's actually very inefficient to communicate between two regions. So in this cluster, to go from any one region to any other, you really need two steps, two jumps for information transfer. Um, so taking this back, what we can ask, with our measure, our pet measure of the tau burden from AV1451 uh, in each of 500 brain parcels, um, how does that relate to the changes in, in connectivity, in, in informational um, processing? And we see a striking difference between Alzheimer's disease and PSP. In Alzheimer's disease, areas that normally have high degrees, a weighted degree that's weighted by the strength as well as the presence of a connection, the more connected a region, the higher its tower burden. Okay. Oops, sorry, I jumped ahead of myself. Um, a very striking relationship, suggesting that those areas that are highly connected are more vulnerable to developing. And from other work in this paper that's now in press, we'd argue actually in receiving a transmissible uh, uh, sort of a, a protein form with a, a sort of prion-like spread, if I perhaps use that term tentatively, in, in receiving that pathology. So highly connected areas are vulnerable to receiving the, the tau pathology. Uh, this is quite different in PSP, when a small cluster of subcortical nodes develop uh, increased elements of tau uh, binding, but a much lesser increase elsewhere. We can also think about not just the vulnerability, but the consequences of that pathology, which also distinguishes um, the Alzheimer's disease tauopathy from PSP tauopathy. So now looking at a single measure per participant, per patient, um, what we see is that the impact of having a crude tau is different um, in the cortical network. So the two groups, and Alzheimer's in red and um, PSP in blue, even at the back of the room, you see these groups are behaving in an opposite way to the presence of accumulating tau. Essentially, in Alzheimer's disease, your cortical network becomes, uh, loses connections, the red line going down. Um, things become more central. In other words, there's a sparsity of the cortical network um, and local efficiency here is reduced in the presence of increasing tau in, in AD. The opposite occurs in PSP, so the degradation of your subcortical network in particular leads to a series of changes, particularly of indirect routes, that actually cause an increase in the graph metrics of connectivity in PSP. So very different consequences revealed through the imaging analysis. Of course, imaging, as I've shown so far with MEG, is a very impoverished tool. Um, so with MRI, we can use MEG to reveal some of the spectral dynamics and more uh, sophisticated information processing properties of, of the brain and local networks uh, using MEG. This study, which is currently under review, but I'm happy to share the, uh, the, the, the data provisionally, compared three types of frontal temporal lobe degeneration, PSP, behavioral variant, and non-fluent variant. And it's showing here local efficiency changes. So these are scalp maps looking on top of the person's nose at the front, ears at the side, at the back of the head. And we see the, on these bottom plots the distribution of altered connectivity. PSP, frontal, frontotemporal in behavioral variant, and a lateralized sort of parietal abnormality in the, the uh, PPA. Although they're different in their topography that fits the clinical phenotype, what they all have in common, if you look closely, is a low frequency change. The, lo the local efficiency is altered in the beta band in particular. Okay. So all these types of FD have a beta de um, deficit in information processing that is completely different from Alzheimer's disease. So in Alzheimer's disease, we again find changes in the topography of local efficiency that goes with the syndrome, so a bitemporal change uh, in typical amnestic AD, in posterior cortical atrophy variant of AD, we find um, uh, particularly a parietal distribution of abnormalities, but here we have the change in particularly gamma frequency. So it's a gamma band of, um, change in connectivity. And these frequency bands are exactly what we would expect from the transgenic models looking at changes in, in gamma power uh, and uh, or beta in the in FTD and Alzheimer models respectively. Because time, I shall skip over that. I'm going to move to how imaging can help uh, facilitate symptomatic treatments, um, particularly with psychopharmacology. 
we'll all be familiar with the frontotemporal atrophy in behavioral variant um, BBFTD. From my point of view, there's not much we can do to reverse that atrophy. You might try and prevent it, um, but you certainly can't reverse it. But what you may not know is there's a marked serotonergic deficit in the frontal and temporal lobes. That is potentially amenable to restoration pharmacologically. So one has the, the hypothesis, perhaps one could restore an inhibition deficit, we're focusing on inhibition, by enhancing serotonin. Both the lateral frontal areas in the prefrontal cortex and serotonin have a, a long and strong preclinical uh, neuroscience background suggesting a role in inhibition. So Laura Hughes looked at this in a randomised placebo-controlled, double-blinded MEG study, comparing controls with FTD initially, and sure enough, in this critical frontal region, there is less, I'm going to call it activity, there's actually current source density, um, and this is restored by uh, citalopram, so restored by serotonergic treatment. So it's a nice market in an experimental context, unconfounded by many of the problems of fMRI, but again, a very impoverished signal compared to what we can get if we look at the, the temporal dynamics and oscillation oscillatory properties um, of MEG. So here I'm showing you time frequency plots. This is time in milliseconds, so about a second and a half after a countermand, asking the patient to not do a, um, a response, not press the button when they're used to pressing the button. And we can see in the y-axis the frequency range, the power in uh, uh, each of the bands from a sort of coming through theta and alpha up to gamma. If, uh, normal controls have a very characteristic beta desynchronization, you can see there's a deep blue blob and a rebound in the red blob. Okay, very characteristic in young and old. The patients with FTD simply don't have that. As a group, they've lost it. But at an individual level, what we find is that the loss of beta desynchronization correlates with the carer's rating of everyday disinhibited behaviors, talking to strangers, crossing the road without looking, eating food off other people's plates. It's very familiar disinhibited behaviors. So this is an ecologically, I think, relevant but laboratory precise signature that the imaging gives us. And we combine that with a pharmacological study. Again, this is a randomized placebo controlled double blinded MEG study in behavioral variant FDD. We show that in the two critical areas for response inhibition, this frontal region and the pre SMA, nice, consistent beta desynchronization and resynchronization, absent to all intents and purposes in the patients on placebo, but restored on citalopram. So, this is an electrophysiological signature of that inhibitory system in an experimental medicines context study, greatly facilitated uh, by the, the use of the imaging method. How are we going to take this forward, though, to disease-modifying therapies? Um, here I'm going to switch back to fMRI. Many of you will know the, the GENFI study, the Genetic FDD Initiative, um, a European and Canadian, I think, and now Australian, and other international sites, looking at members of families where there's either progranulin, uh, tau, or c 9 uh, mutations. Um, this is the, the data published on, on the first data freeze from John Rohr in the Lancet Neurology two years ago, showing that if we relate the imaging changes, the structural imaging changes on MRI, to the expected time of onset based on the family member's age of onset, um, we see marked changes over the years uh, in structure, uh, in key areas beginning or most markedly in temporal uh, and insular cortex. Of course, you don't need you know, fancy, fancy techniques to identify something very badly wrong in this patient seven or eight years after onset. But what we're interested in is those more subtle changes that are without symptoms, 5, 10, 15, in the case of C9 off, up to 20 years before symptom onset. And this gives us a measurable outcome marker for potential trials that are aimed at preventing the onset of symptomatic dementia with some, uh, something trackable, repeatable, safe, with a trajectory of decline that our, bio, uh, that our new treatment might try and arrest, trying to level off or stave off the um, progressive atrophy uh, and with that uh, defer the onset of disease. But this is structural connectivity. You think, well, these people are well. These, pa these people here in this, these 10, 20 years from onset have dramatically changing brain structure, but they are symptomatically well. Why is that? Well, I'm going to then contrast structural imaging, as has been published so far, from functional imaging. And this is work, again, from Tim Rittman, looking at the degree, the de connectedness of the brain parcellation, looking at the average uh, degree uh, in the Genfi cohort. Um, and what we see is that People who are not yet symptomatic maintain their functional connectivity, the integrity of information transfer, even in the face of marked atrophy. So the atrophy is going on during this period, uh, basically with atrophy, but they're able to maintain 
connectivity. And at about the, the breakpoint analysis, identified a breakpoint that was less than a year from the actual symptom onset, which I thought was a really encouraging result. And what it shows is that at the time at which you start to become symptomatic, you have a collapse in brain functional connectivity. So as soon as you can no longer maintain functional integration and information transfer, you rapidly progress into a symptomatic phase. Um, so then it puts the focus not just on things you might wish to do to delay atrophy, but things you might do to try and enhance or maintain function integration through synaptic uh, modifiers or pharmacological approaches to push back symptom onset. So just to tie this together, I've given a really whistle-stop tour through a number of methods. I began by presenting the data on the tau pet ligands, um, showing how they're sensitive to the quantity and, importantly, the distribution of the pathology in behavioral vendetta, PSP, non-fluent aphasia. But, and there's a catch, they're also very sensitive to semantic dementia, so they bind to something in relation to uh, TDP43 pathologies. So they're very good to quantify pathology, perhaps even in longitudinal trials, but they're not going to help you discriminate tau from TDP43 cases in vivo. I then introduced the idea of how structural um, domains really define the progressive course of the illness and the extent to which different symptoms accrue and the, the syndromes evolve, and we can track the underlying uh, correlates of those modes of illness and disease expression, the phenotypic uh, domains. We then I introduced the concept of brain graphs and the ways you can measure graphs just in a brain network as you could in an airline network or social network, Twitter, for those of us on, on Twitter as this meeting goes on. And we could look at the impact of how accruing tau is more likely for well-connected areas, but it also has consequences for the degradation of ne that network, particularly in, in AD. And that the changes in local efficiency, this graph metric of information transfer, has frequency-specific as well as topological characteristics with frontotemporal lobe degeneration syndromes. <laughs> and finally, I came on to how we can try and integrate different imaging modalities, here focusing on the physiology to find laboratory precise experimental medicines markers that link to uh, ecological aspects of the disease. Um, and finally, looking at how some of these might be carried forward into also disease modifying treatments. So what about aspirations? I've not touched on the first one, I focus on the second and third, but I think this wealth of imaging modalities in the plural is a really important part of the approach towards uh, better models and better treatments of all the FTLD disorders. I'd just like to thank the many people who've actually done the work. I need to say, and this wasn't done by me, it's a huge team that's behind this, uh, and thank you for listening. <laughs>